Hey, how's it going, folks? It's Little Lumi here for another session of How to Practice. And we're continuing on from last week where I was doing uh, a vocal accompaniment. I'm going to do more of the same. <laughs> I'm hoping the battery in my, on my pedal will last for the whole session. So anyway, yeah, we're going to do some warm-ups and then uh, I'm going to do uh, a couple of exercises uh, to do with the uh, improving your ability to play bass notes uh, with chords and uh, then I'm going to run through a couple of tunes that I'm playing with the uh, Bran Ray um, a bunch of concerts this week and um, yeah so uh, please follow the channel don't forget to do that also if you're watching this on uh, any of the other platforms hit that like button hit that share button do all the things help us to grow the channel So first let's do a little bit of a warm up and uh, I like to do the chromatic scale as a warm up. So I'm going to do that um, and then I'm going to do some finger exercises as well and uh, and then we'll kick straight in with the, the chords and the bass notes thing and I will explain at that point. So for those of you that don't know, I like to do my uh, practice sessions in three phases. Uh, the warm-up phase and then uh, the sort of study phase and then the performance stroke playing phase so the, the, the warm-up phase is kind of self-explanatory I do a bunch of exercises that uh, help me warm up also I like to include in that you know dexterity exercises things like that stuff that isn't like like it's not necessarily targeting uh, anything to do with harmony or stuff like that. It's mainly to do with just improving your finger movements and things like that. Uh, they're usually the best exercises for warming up. And then uh, uh, during the study uh, um, phase, I like to uh, explore different things, try and expand my knowledge. Uh, it's also an opportunity to learn new tunes, uh, trying to do stuff that I don't, I don't know. Uh, you know things I have a hard time with, and then in the uh, performance stroke playing phase, that's when I like to uh, uh, zero in on actually making music and uh, play some songs and things like that. You always want to move towards that. That's always got to be the goal. If you get too, that's the thing. If practice becomes too technical or too boring or too repetitive then it stops actually helping you improve and it might even become such a burden that you'll stop doing it and so you don't want that you want you want uh, your practice to lead towards the fulfillment of playing that's you know that's the goal it's it's all at the service of uh playing uh, music and, you know so yeah don't get too wrapped up on being obsessed with such and such an exercise or such and such a technical tune that you know you never managed to play correctly you also have to include fun stuff stuff you enjoy stuff that you like in order to make it worthwhile so yeah don't lose your targets from sight uh, you know in the drudgery of practice 
So anyway, let's get cracking. Uh, this is adult stream, so there might be some swearing. You've been warned. And here uh, is uh, the chromatic scale uh, uh, in first position, starting with the little pinky finger and going all the way down and then back up again. <laughs> Okay, so there I just did the, the chromatic scale uh, up and down and then did it jumping a note. I'm going to do it jumping two notes. Thank you. 
Okay, so there I did it jumping two notes and then jumping three notes. Okay, so um, let's do a couple of uh, other finger exercises. I'm going to do um, some right hand exercises. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, we're going to try and exercise all of the fingers and then alternate in between finger and thumb. And, and mainly like do it in a percussive way. So it's not necessarily going to be notes, it's just going to be like rhythm. And that's always a good to, good idea to do, to kind of focus on your rhythm rather than, uh, sorry, I was speaking away from the mic. Um, yeah, focus on your rhythm rather than always sort of being obsessed with the notes because rhythm is probably even more important than the choice of notes. You know, the, the brain recognizes rhythm easier than it recognizes notes. Like, uh, you know, uh, so if you do the rhythmical phrase correctly, but you get the notes wrong, a lot of time people will still recognize the tune. Yeah. Dun 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 dun. So yeah, so if you get your rhythm happening, then it will give you a lot more co uh, like uh, recognition power when it comes to playing melodies and being you know in the pocket, as people like to say about grooving. So yeah, so this exercise is. Uh, Entirely, the goal is to just have an even, like, rhythm to it. And I'm just going to be playing all of the fingers. Okay, so that was the first exercise uh, for the right hand, just moving up and down. And I was kind of messing about towards the end there, because it sounded a bit like a drum beat. Do, 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 ga, do, 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 ga. Sounded pretty cool. So anyway, yeah, uh, now we're going to alter alternate in between the thumb and the fingers, uh, or at least the first finger, and um, 
I'm going to do that uh, on each string. So here I'm going to actually let the, the note ring out. This is very similar to an exercise you would do with a plectrum, just up and down on one string. It seems like a basic exercise, but it's super important. All your sound comes from your right hand, so if you're not competent with just the, this basic movement, then you're gonna have a real hard time when it comes to actually trying to play soulfully and rhythmically and have a good attack. But all of your attack comes from your right hand, so. Okay, so now that we've done that, now that we've done that, we can talk about uh, this idea of uh, bass notes and, and, and chords. So one of the things is, as a guitar player, you, you often have a tendency to play in three different ways. Uh, either... Um, you'll be playing in a chordal manner or you'll be playing in a riff type manner or you'll be playing in a like a, what I would call a solo type manner. So if you look at the, 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 the chordal manner is, is usually where people are at when they're accompanying a singer or a solo or a soloist. Uh, you play the chords 
other person does the melody and the lyrics, or just the melody in the case of if it's a solo instrument. Then the, the riff is this idea of uh, playing a repetitive line or phrase. Uh, you know, it could be part of a groove, the, the way a song's written, rather than it being chords, it might be single notes and a repetitive phrase, you know, groove or whatever. Often uh, something that's repeated by the, the bass quite often. Um, and then the solo uh, sort of mode is where you'd be playing up in the top register and playing melody and uh, improvising melody and so on. So, you know, most of the time a guitar will be in either of these three modes uh, when they're doing accompaniment. Now, uh, this exercise I want to show you is an exercise that essentially uh, allows you to free up the bottom end so that you can um, rather than uh, your bottom end just being the same as the chord that you're playing uh, rhythmically and melodically like for example if we play a bunch of chords right there the the bass notes are just the notes of the chords, and as you play the chords, the, you know, one can consider the lowest note the bass note, right? So uh, the exercises that we're going to do now are going to free up that lower note and move it around. The simplest version of that is you choose a chord, any chord, let's say we just take a, I don't know, C major chord, you could do it two ways, you could do it this way. We could do it this way. So let's look at it, this one first position, and uh, and then we can. So now the idea is we have our lowest note, and what we're going to do is we're going to try and move that low note around. Now the most obvious way of moving it around is to move it to uh, the uh, E string. Because it's on the same fret. So for you guys that are into country or folk music, this is a perfect example of being able to move around and create that bass line effect. See what happened there? So, all of a sudden we have the chord... Also have the bass line so already it starts to become interesting okay the next thing is to try and move uh, the note um, the lowest note up and down from its initial point so here we're in C so if we went down now we're at B and if we were to move down again to A. So let's do that again. And it's up to you to work out the fingering of this, what's easier for you. you know? And again, we can uh, shift in between um, uh, the the A string and the E string. Now you might think, yeah, but some of that doesn't sound nice, some of that does sound nice. But it's all a question of context, isn't it? It might be that uh, that particular form uh, combined with other chords can work out quite nicely for you. Ultimately, the, the idea here is to free up the bottom end so that you're comfortable moving it around whilst maintaining the top part of your chord. Now, 
let's see if we can go up a little bit. So again, it's, it's slightly different when you're going up because eventually you'll start to get to the previous the notes in the chord. And so, you know, I mean, you could, in theory, move up in the voicings, but I feel that that's an exercise for another day. Um, and we're also de deviating from the point here. The point here is to get used to maintaining a chord whilst changing its bass note. That's kind of the goal, really. Let's look at G major, for example. So, you know, I'm just getting used to uh, m moving around the bass note, and you'll notice that uh, here uh, the the fingers that I use switch around to whatever's more comfortable. See that? Funnily enough, when it comes to actual playing, what you'll find is you'll be in two different types of situation. One is where uh, you'll um, um, be playing both the note, the bass note, and the rest of the chord at the same time. And in other situations, you'll be playing the bass note uh, in between the chords. Now, in order to really get you know, hip to being able to do that. It's 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 more advisable to maintain the chord, even if you're not playing it, until you have to change chords in the song. Like, it just works out as just psychologically a better plan. Um, you know, if you, that's why it's it's a good ex good exercise to do. You know, like say like. Uh, Imagine if our bass line was, right? but the chord is G, right? so. So I'm main, you know, maintaining my chord, and um, but then the B line is kind of moving around. But when you know we're not doing anything else than what we just did before. <laughs>
So, again, you'll notice that the same thing happened there. Like, um, when I changed the chord, I still maintained its position until the next chord, even if the notes of the bass notes changed. Don't get trapped into this idea of, like, playing the bass notes in between notes without there being a chord structure around it. Like, yeah. <laughs> You see, all of a sudden it starts to sound a bit like more laborious when I'm thinking, oh, when I play just one note, I don't need to hold my chord position. You see what I mean? So like here, because I'm holding the same chord, prog chord position, it actually means that uh, there's a sort of continuity uh, So that way, uh, there's there's you know there's more continuity. There's less movement in the top end, so I'm not tiring myself out. Uh, but it does require for you to know the mechanics of how you want to be able to use each finger and uh, where it's going to go depending on the chord. So that's one example. With the, we, we did we did C, we did G. Uh, let's do like. D. I just did it. If you're wondering why I'm not doing like ch chromatically or like a scale or something, it's because you've got to remember that for the most part, you're not going to be playing scales, you're going to be playing songs. So it's a good idea when you're doing exercises, especially these types of exercises, to, to work more via your taste of like what sounds cool rather than uh, systematically doing every single different uh, possibility. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's a reasonable idea to do every single possibility to see what it sounds like. But I feel that there's, you know, there's also opportunities to uh, find interesting uh, chord structures and things that sound nice, usually repeated, so, like, if you think it sounds nice, then more than likely there's a bunch of songs that will contain that chordal movement. And so when you come across that song and you're like, oh, I need to play it, hooray, you've actually practiced that movement. And it's not, like, jarring because you're used to practicing it chromatically or, like, in a scale thing. So that's why uh, I recommend to also... You know, don't just do the scale thing or be systematic. You also have to be a bit... 
quite whimsical. Again, you'll see that in some cases you don't necessarily have to change your finger positioning, but in other cases you do. So with all of those, I didn't have to change the rest of the, 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 the finger positioning. But if I'm playing this... Or And again, like I say, it might seem weird, but the fact that you're doing this will make it so that you know what options you have if you need to play a bass note whilst the chord stays the same. Because this is really the goal here. Besides also, you know, creating interesting uh, inversions, you know, or reharmonizations of a chord. Like, for example, when I play... Um, Oh, there's a song that I play with Fran where the ending goes like this. Sorry. So that's the main kind of riff. And so for the coda, for the end of the song, I wanted to uh, do a bunch of different reharmonizations of that, but keeping that that movement going a dagger to a dagger to a dagger to a dagger. So that meant I had to move the bass note around, so it became. So this is a very nice ending for the song. And so again, like being able to shift that around comfortably requires for me to change position, like here. When I move this, the, the, the A to the, the F sharp, then it becomes. And then when I move up to the G, So yeah, so like there you can you know take a phrase and move the bottom part around now that you know that there's the, what the options are. And like I say, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the the logic of this is it allows you that freedom to uh, move the bass uh, note around independently of your chord structure, whilst maintaining that chord structure, even if you're not playing it, because it just gives you that uh, ability in some cases to 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 make the chord note keep on rolling, you know. So 
that's quite good. See, all of a sudden it opens up the door to loads of hip stuff and uh, and it gives that illusion of um, the bass and uh, the chord being independent of each other. But it all comes from you having in your mind these different options of fingering positions to be able to shift that lower, the lowest note. So um, uh, let's do, this is another exercise I like to do, which is go like this. See how that works? So the idea is you're playing on one fret and your four fingers away, like four frets away uh, above, and then you're just shifting that lower note and then going it to your all the way four fingers below. And again, it's just getting you used to being able to move three different fingers whilst maintaining like some top end. And also it's just like there's a lots of, uh, you know, the, the, where I got this from, where I started to find this was when I was doing uh, the chord exercise where you just move one note. But what I started to discover was uh, that, um, you know, that enables you to create new chords and stuff. But in the bottom register, it really does allow you to get used to being able to uh, shift your fingering around whilst still maintaining that top end uh, and you know reharmonizing that bass and then all of a sudden when you're playing songs you've got these other options that you didn't have before because you're comfortable with shifting you know like uh, that typical reharmon discord here it came from one of those explorations you know when I was like doing Oh, that sounds nice. Suddenly, you've got this independent flavor. it gets you more comfortable with doing like what I call reversals where you know your fingers all in one direction and then they have to shift in the other direction you know if you play a chord where your first finger is the low note you're playing a chord where your third finger is the low note you know what I mean you that those interesting flavors Thank you. 
so yeah so that you know kind of uh, takes us around on a, you know, a few different uh, exercises that you can work on to essentially free up the bottom end free up the you know the lower notes uh, and allow you that fluidity to be able to do passage notes on on the lower notes uh, to go from one chord to the other which is really what it's about isn't it See, so, and like I say, it gives you the extra flex rather than just playing the chords. It gives you that extra flavor, you know. And especially when you're accompanying a vocalist or soloist, to have, be able to put a bit of bass line groove into, you know, what would just be one chord, like... what you would play when you're playing those two chords what is that uh, g minor seven and then uh, c major right but you know if you added like a bass line flair to that sudden it's got groove it's got flavor and that can be really handy you know when you're in a duo situation to, just to give things a little bit more drive right <laughs> thing same chords but just by adding that bass line flair all of a sudden everything sounds cooler and you've got these other harmonies like rather than just So there you go. Like you can get a whole heap of, uh, you know, flavor and flex out of um, so little just by adding that little bit of baseline texture to everything, you know, and um, and by shifting those bass notes around, creating a riff. 
Uh, and so it combines um, two of those elements there, like the riff element, which you quite often have with bass lines, and the chordal element, which gives you two elements to accompany a soloist with rather than just the one. And it can add a lot more rhythm or, or just harmonic you know, interest, like I find, you know, that, that's, you know, that sounds pretty nice, isn't it? So yeah, so let's get into doing some songs. I'm still, you know, rehearsing quite a few songs with, uh, Fran Ray, but we're performing this week. That's why, that's why I held back on pulling out my bass that I got back from Guillaume Messi on the weekend. He's been uh, fixing it for me. So yeah, so what was that song that section and it's escaping me where's the the other bit no no I can't remember it there's like a key change there's a key change and uh, where does it go does it like <laughs> Thank you. 
That's called Take Me To To The River by Al Green. And uh, yeah, this is interesting because this is a prime example of if you were just to play the chords, you wouldn't get the flavor of the song. It wouldn't come out. And so you need to get those little riffs happening just to make it sound more like the song. If I was just to play... So it sounds all right because the song's a good, it's a good song. But now let me play it with including the bass riffs and like, like the phrasing. So you can see how, like, just adding that riff, changing up those bass notes, adds a whole bunch of, you know, flavor and energy to the to the tune. There's there's two places where it really comes comes into its own. That's where I'm doing it.
comes when playing a lot of blues, because that's kind of a blues riff. takes you from the minor to the major, minor third to the major third. And the reason why you're doing it with these fingers is so you can maintain your chord here once again. Right. And the other bit, comes into it gives in the bridge section um, see so There you go. Take me to the river, which is a new song that we've started to work on with uh, Fran Ray. And like I say, you you can see you know illustrating how freeing up the bottom end to be able to do riffs, to do passage notes, will just funk up you know jazz up and just add more flavour to what would just be straight up. But you know chords that change on the bar or change with the you know uh, whatever rhythm that you're uh, you're you're playing out. Um, so yeah, what was the just a couple of other tunes that I wanted to work on today? Um, let me see if I can remember. Struggling a bit with the old memory as I get older. Oh yeah, there's a song. It's been, it's been such a while since I since I played it, and for some odd reason, I started to uh, get confused as to what the chords were. You don't want to be in ambiguity. Ambiguity is the worst, uh, especially when it comes to jazz. If you're unsure, then it, it it kind of translates to the playing. So even I remember last time I played the song, still got through it, but. It wasn't as steady, and uh, I'm sure Fran felt it, and it made her feel a bit un unsure. It made the whole song a bit unstable, and so you don't want that. You want to be you're the accompaniment, so you need to be the the vehicle that the soloist is performing on. And if you're shaky, then the lead performance will it will translate to the lead performance. And yeah, in some cases, vice versa, but it's but it's more your responsibility of the accompaniment to provide the support the vocalist needs to be free to soar in the skies isn't it so anyway this song is called uh, someone to watch over me and there's, there's this descent section and for some odd reason uh, you know after having played it for years and years i just had a doubt i was like i don't know what these chords are and uh, so yeah so it's going to be an opportunity to have a look at that. Thank you. 
So yeah, you see, like, it's come back to me now, but um, yeah, just having that doubt in the moment totally caused complete havoc for me during the gig. And let's just have a look at these chords. You've got the first, the intro. So yeah, you can see how, uh, again, like uh, in this case, uh, especially when I was doing the more instrumental version, um, it's the melody that's moving around and the bass is not moving around as much. I was trying to get that, the bit that was causing me trouble, which is the chorus a bit. This bit. And I want to 
get so it goes boom 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 right I haven't quite managed to get it. See this thing. So yeah, just getting that, just that pulse with the bottom end makes, you know, makes the whole thing vibe. So not, because it always, the, the idea is everything's rubato up until the point you get to that bit.
So yeah, so there you see I was doing a more accompaniment based version than the solo version that I did before. That I wasn't playing playing the melody anymore, or well, at least not focusing on it. I was playing the chords and then doing some more in the bottom end because again that's what we were looking at. You know, diversifying the bottom end, uh, making notes to go from chord to chord and to be able to do that those exercises that I showed you earlier on are very handy and uh, and it definitely you know it gives a different feel to the song but you can imagine it also it, it allows for a better vehicle for the singer they can really get into it you know because there's the rhythm there like once you start moving the the bottom end around you can start tapping out like a groove there especially like, See that it makes it into a, like a actual bass line happening, and uh, and adds more rhythm and in some cases a bit more harmonic interest. You know, which time when we get down to it. Like So yeah, very, very cool. Someone to watch over me. It's like a jazz standard. I don't know who wrote it, uh, but it's 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 a bit of a guitar classic. I've played it before in, in uh, How to Improvise. Uh, it's become a bit of a guitar-y song because of the how you can accompany yourself with, the, with those chords. But it's a nice tune. I'm going to uh, keep on going with um, Sunrise, which is a song I practiced last week, and I'm going to do it uh, just for the fun, the fun of it, because of, you know, practicing it and practicing it, it's also a good idea to play it and enjoy playing it and explore it. So that's what I'm going to do now. <laughs>
So again, you can see, like, there is quite a large difference in between the approach when you're playing the accompaniment, where you're focusing more on the bottom end and the chords, to when you're playing solo, and then you're kind of focusing more on the top end, you know, in the notes. Uh, that are above. You know, so I mean, already just the, the chord choices, like, you know, if I'm playing accompaniment, in the chorus I go... Where have I lost volume here? I've lost... Hang on. that's how I'd play it you know when I'm playing with a singer in mind or a soloist playing the melody whereas when I was playing by myself it'd be slightly different <laughs> So you see already just the chord choice, I'm not even in the same place so that I can actually get those high notes. So it's a, it like a different, you know, different chord uh, position. In everything, is it totally different, man? It's completely, utterly, totally, and utterly different. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, I've done enough for today. I'm starting to get a bit achy. It's full season, so I'm trying not to uh, overdo on the practice uh, because there's so many gigs going on. But there's a bunch of mo you know there's, there's more new tunes that I have to uh, slowly get the hang out hang of and um, introduce into the set as well. There's a sunrise and take me to the river. There's a, I think another Al Green. Um, Let's stay together, I think it is. I think I played that last week. I can't remember. So anyway, uh, thanks for your to tuning in. And uh, obviously, if you're watching this on YouTube, hit the like button, hit the share button, spread the word. Um, and that way there can be more and more of us uh, chilling out and practicing together. Don't forget to practice. Keep it, Keep it going. And remember, you can always try and keep it interesting. Don't get bored of your own playing. And in order to do that, you've got to always expand. Don't be afraid of not being able to do something. You know, I'll come on here and I'll make a million mistakes, but it's because I'm practicing. 
and uh, you know in order to get better you've got to push your boundaries so on that note uh, I'll catch you soon and uh, take care <laughs>
Mm-hmm. <laughs>